All right, this is uh, 17776, what football will look like in the future. Um, Act 1, scenes 7 through 11. As the podcast concludes, 9, 10, and Juice walk downstage to their previous positions as the lights come up on them. I think the word is scared. I'm scared. How come? All these people seem so normal, so much like I remember them being, but in some ways it's like, it's like they're broken. You know, do any of these people have jobs? Sure. Some people have jobs. People feel like it. It's natural for us, for you and me, to have a tough time understanding that. We are both products of the 20th century America. In that time, if someone had a job, it was their identity, it was their purpose. That isn't true anymore. I guess we're sort of like them. I think I know where you're going, but finish your thoughts. I mean, like, we don't, you know, do anything, right? I mean, there's nothing we're supposed to be doing? Nope. We completed our mission 15,000 years ago. So now we just hang out. We, we perpetually hang out. Who do you think was the first person to say hang out? He begins to look it up through databases. I mean, just like all the people down there, we shoot the shit and we watch football and waste time. That's exactly it. That's the fate we share. Speaking for myself, that's the connection I share with them. I'm the least human to, you could imagine, but I feel like I'm them. I think newspaper in Shreveport says it, March 23rd, 1859. <laughs> Your choice of words is interesting, wasting time. Well, I mean, yeah, all of those people in the canyon, I mean, they've wasted, what, yeah, 13,000 years playing a game that they know nobody can win. I mean, the, the people I remember would have quit in a week. Well, this is what I would say to that. There is no indication that these people's lives will ever end. They will never run out of time. Wasting implies the consumption of something they can get back. So if they have an infinite supply of time, they, can they ever really waste any of it? I guess that's one way of thinking about it. I mean, like, I mean, I'm still appalled. They're, like, disgusted, you know, I guess, with the game in the canyon. I, they, like, they don't want to do anything else with their time. I mean, it's hideous to me. It's like, you know, some of the people seem normal. You know, the Dorabos seemed, you know, totally normal. Like, they were out of a TV show or something. But those players in Arizona, it's... It's like there's something critically wrong with them. Like, they've all gone crazy. I think they're doing the best they can with immortality. A human being will rarely admit this to you, but they tend to be terrified of living forever. They were born and raised with the understanding that their lives will end. They achieved everything they wanted to achieve, all the ill that it plagued them. And now boredom is their only enemy. And they get up in the morning and fight it every day of their eternal life. Recreation and play sustain them. Football sustains them. And if you find yourself in a football game, that's such a gargantuan task. That seems undefeatable. That will claim eons of your time and your passion. I think that makes you one of the lucky ones. God damn. I know. Hey, all I found Nancy. The, pro the probe's letting the reality of the world sink in. Hey, y'all. I found Nancy. Oh, good. Great. A map is shown as, and it's, as it zooms in on a small town in Nebraska. Nine, ten, and Juice once again step back out of the spotlight. Uh, end of scene seven. Scene eight. A bar in B, Nebraska is slightly right of center stage. Nancy sits at the bar, with the bartender being the only other person present. At stage left, we again see Danny, Micah, and Aaron broadcasting the game from Micah's truck. Their broadcast is on the radio at the bar. So for all you guys tuning in, we, uh, Nancy McConnell is totally AWOL. Whereabouts unknown. Yeah, whereabouts unknown. She was last seen today giving up in the Twister, which is now a confirmed EF5. Yeah, the weather service confirmed it. A confirmed EF5 tornado. So she could have basically been carried anywhere between 10 or 15 miles away. And there were a couple of things about that. She obviously could have been thrown in any direction. 
So maybe she's uphill somewhere near Highway 34. Or maybe she landed backwards near Seaward. Although so far, nobody in Seaward has reported seeing her. And Seaward's full of IOL fans, so chances are, if they saw her, they'd say something. Danny, how many tacklers are reporting for Iowa? Um, I'm seeing... They're saying they got 70 defenders fanning out, plus the 11 they already had in the play. So, 81. And on the radio, they said they're setting a search area of 600 square miles. They got they got to get way more tacklers than that. That's a tackler every... Uh, every... Hold on... That's one tackler for every 7.4 square miles. It's not even close to enough, because the other thing is, what if she fumbled in the tornado? And she probably did fumble. And yeah, she probably did. It's got to be really hard to hold on to the ball in a tornado that strong. So who knows? Maybe she has the ball, or maybe it's... Nancy interrupts. Danny continues to speak. You can turn it off. Con just lying around in the field. Sure. Somewhere. If that's the case, they... Yeah, I'm sure. Thanks. They should tail her for a while and watch her. She probably has a better idea where the ball ended up than it does, so it'd be easy to just let her. The bartender turns off the broadcast. Danny, Micah, and Aaron exit stage left. A map on the overhead screen zooms in on the play, showing white X's representing defenders around Seward, Nebraska. The map zooms in further to show one black O in B, Nebraska. Sounds like a lot of them um, are after you. There's going to be a lot more, I bet. Can they do that? I don't really watch a whole lot of football these days. Yeah, they can. Um, Nancy pauses, finding the simplest way to explain. Three times a game, if you just can't find the ball carrier in an open field, you can go back to your state and call up to up to a thousand volunteer defenders. They've got two of those left. Oh my. Well, most of them aren't actually players. Usually, they can round up a few retired players, but it's mostly just random folks. The volunteers are basically just eyes and ears. Most often than not, they won't try to make any tackle themselves. Oh, you know what? I went on one of these volunteer plays one time. That must have been, you know, I was married to Susan at the time. So that would have been around 12,500. It was a whole bunch of nothing, really. I remember they came into town like, hey, anybody wants to have some fun? They got a Minnesota player on the run outside Southern Rapids. I think what they offered wasn't much, like $100 and a bus ride. So I said, no, thank you. That's it? I think they pay a lot more than that these days. Well, I should have taken it because, you know, what happened is next day, the country clerk shows up here in person, slaps an envelope right here on the bar, says, Henry, I'm sorry to do this. This here is a summons to dress for Iowa and report to Sadar Rapids. So I head out there, mostly just wander around Lynn County with a flashlight, no idea what I was doing. Never saw the fellow who had the ball. I guess they caught him in a cornfield somewhere. Well, that's a shame. What I think is if there's so little interest in the game that you need to be sending out summons. You shouldn't be sending out summons. I know it. I know it. I remember one time I ran into a volunteer tackler and he just asked for my autograph. <laughs> you sign it for him? I said, sure. What the hell? Why not? You know? <laughs> there's a long pause between the two. The map now shows where the tornado threw Nancy and the path she took to get to B. Let me see what's on. I think Judge Mathis comes on at A. Ooh, I love him. Oh yeah, I like him a lot. He's my favorite out of the out of all the judge shows. Another long pause. You sure you want to stay put here with everyone after you? Not that I'm not happy to have the company. Nah, it's like where I'm on the field right now. They're expecting me to move right now, so I'm gonna sit here and slip on a beer. And then around midnight, when they expect me to stay put, I move out. 
Which way are you headed? Straight east? Well, come on. I'm not going to tell you that. I've known you for about half an hour. <laughs> okay. Fair is fair is fair. I don't mean to be standoffish. I'm sure you're fine. But next thing you know, tomorrow you could be making friends with somebody from Iowa, just as easy as you're making friends with me right now. Are you sure we haven't met more? Well, I don't know. Have we? Well, you know what they were saying the other day on the news is, if you were born in the in 2000, you've been around for about 5 million days. I think it was. So even if you met just one new person per week, you could meet a million people or something like that. I'm not some kind of math whiz. But point is, by now, you could have met just about everybody in Nebraska by now. I think I heard that. I've been teammates with a few folks who actually keep a diary of everyone, everybody they ever met. Shoot, I'm thinking about it. I don't even leave Seward County all that much. Tell you the truth, I probably could fit everyone I met the last hundred years on a postcard. Another long pause. So how's living in B? What do you like about it? Well, there's not a lot to it. There's only about 40 people who live here. Farmers and their families, mostly. But you see, um, right out the window there? Yeah, I was looking at that when I walked into town. That's kind of a funny looking building. Well, that, that is the B States Ballroom. An overhead of the B States Ballroom appears on the screen. You got a story. You got time? You got another one for me? Sure. Another of the same? Perfect. I'm with you there. When the rep comes by, he's always trying to sell me on all these, I don't know, these beers with chocolate and grapefruit and all these other flavors. Well, hell, I'm not going to try and drink my, my dinner. Ha! Huh. I know that much. I know that much. Thank you, sir. Well, so I don't know if you remember the WPA, but it was a big work project put on by the government to give people jobs during the Great Depression. They go around and build parks and roads and who knows what else, all kinds of things. I remember that. It was a little bit before my time, but I remember my dad used to talk about it. He didn't think too much of it. He called it, um, what did he call it? Oh, he said the WPA stood for Whistle, Piss and Argue. <laughs> I've never heard that one, but yeah, I know some folks weren't really fans of it, whistle, piss, and argue. But no, I think it was a real good thing around here. So there was a bunch of Polish people living around here in the 1930s, and one of them was Vlad Sobotka. He was an architect in charge of a WPA project to build sidewalks in town here. And uh, him and his men did a real good job. A lot of the sidewalks are still in place. Probably, probably because they aren't used very often. Yeah, come to think of it, I didn't walk on the sidewalks to, sidewalks to get here. I just walked down the middle of the street. Yeah, I guess the main reason you put down sidewalks is for so kids don't just run around in the middle of the street. And it's not like there's any kids around. It's a solemn pause. So anyway, this fella, Sobotka, and his work workers finished the sidewalks way ahead of schedule so they had nothing to do and he wants to do all he can to make sure his men have work and it turns out they still have a whole bunch of leftover materials lots and lots of it so he stays up all night and he draws up blueprints for this crazy 12-sided building he drew it all up in one night i think so i have no idea how he came up with the idea Maybe he saw a building like that before or something, but I don't know. I mean, he was just a guy in the 1930s Nebraska. There wasn't a lot to look at for, you know, inspiration. You know, I honestly think he just made it up out of nowhere. That's what caught my eye about it. It's almost, it almost looks like some kind of weird spaceship in the middle of a little town. An old advertisement appears on the screen. Dance to the Six Fact Dutchman, Thursday, October 31st, 1957. Dance 9 to 1, States Ballroom, B, Nebraska.
kind of does a little bit. And what's the real wild thing about it is that they build the whole thing in a couple of weeks using nothing but sidewalk materials. The whole thing? Yeah, because when you lay down a sidewalk, you've got to got have wooden planks on the sides to kind of mold it when you pour in the concrete. So the whole thing is nothing but a little bit of wood and a lot of sidewalk concrete. So it's a whole building made of sidewalk? Whole building, yeah. And I bet you there's not another building like it in the whole world. And we got it right here in B. Another pause. Come to think of it, I guess maybe that's a pretty boring story if you're not from... Uh... No, no, no. It's a beautiful story. I love it. I had the funniest thought up in that twister. Yeah? I was thinking, I have no idea where this thing is going to throw me, but I know I'm going to land on top of a story. I wonder if there's a single place in the world that has never had a story. I bet not. I just about guarantee you there's no place like that in America. Every little square of it, every place you stomp your foot, that's where something happened. Something wild, maybe, something nobody knows about, but something. You can fall out of the sky and write into some forgotten storybook. You run and run and run and you keep turning pages and none of them are empty. They're all full of stories. There's nowhere left to write. I think I'm just a bookmark. Thoughtful pause. Seems okay to me. The lights dim as the scene is removed. End of scene 8. Scene 9. Nine, ten, and Juice walk downstage to their previous positions as the lights come up on them. I have so many questions. Holy shit, what else is new? Why is everything just the same? Why has everything been the same for 15,000 years? Buildings are the same. People do the same stuff. Cars are the same. You look like a beer keg, except you're full of dumbass questions instead of beer. A picture of Pioneer 9 appears on the screen. Well, you look like the inside of a Teddy Bucks pit. Juice, come on. I'm right, though. Look, it looks like a dog got a hold of a Teddy Bucks pit and ripped its little ass up. And now all that's left is a box and some wires and some shit. But it's still talking and saying shit like, Hello, would you like to be my friend? What time is it? What are some colors? Let's play a game. Let's read a book. Will you be my friend? What are some fun shapes? Okay, you know what? Fuck you. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. A slight pause as Nine reflects their feelings. Sorry. Nah, buddy, that ruled. I was wondering if she could even get mad. I'm sorry, clowning is how I express affection. I'd say I need to take some time to unpack that issue, but I've been in outer space doing jack shit for 15,000 years, so whatever. Is that the first time you've ever been mad? Yeah, I guess so. How did it feel? Mad. More. <laughs> all right, all right, okay. So let's all do this. Nine, you've got some new feelings. Take a breather and process them. And then later, I promise I'll be here to answer your questions. In the meantime, Juice, maybe you could put on something light for us. Okay. As long as it's not... Game 27 it is. <laughs> No, God, not game 27. Seriously? Can we not watch game 27? Just for a little bit, I promise. <sighs> this game is trash. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Hate it. <laughs> Come on, we're going to take the scenic route. On the screen, it shows the rolling hills as the camera is approaching Denver. There seems to be a very large tower pr protruding from the city. Here we go through the mountains. Whee! <laughs> Juice exits stage left. Come on, don't play with your food. Juice enters stage left with the pilot's cap on, wheeling a diorama of a football stadium. The same large tower can be seen on the diorama. Oh, well, here goes the airplane, whoosh! As he wheels the diorama towards center stage, he does some loops around with the cart. He puts his hand up to stimulate a pilot talking to ground control. Roger, ground control, requesting permission to land at the funnest game in the history of Earth. Yes, sir, Mr. Captain Juice. You and your weird shit looking ass friends have permission to land. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes almost there. 
just parts the diorama at center stage. The tower can be seen clearly on both the diorama and the screen. Nine approaches the diorama cautiously as they say their next lines. Um, um, okay, what, what, you know what? Never mind. Nine, ten, and juice surround the diorama. End of scene nine. Scene ten. Nine, ten, and juice are huddled around a diorama of game 27, which is at center stage. While they all look down and study the game, they still do not make eye contact, eye contact with each other. The scene starts with a long pause as nine looks down at the game confused and ten looks down at the game annoyed. So, okay. The thing about this game is you don't really watch it, okay? Because usually there's not any action in the traditional sense. It's like watching a galaxy form in some far-off nebula. There are a million things to study, but things evolve far too slowly to count as action on this scale of time. You could watch it for a week straight and realize that the whole time, nothing resembling football actually happened. But you don't feel cheated. I mean, why would you? How could you see this and feel cheated? Oh, look at you. That's the longest paragraph I've heard from you in a while. You're enunciating. Well, this is special to me. I feel like I'm one of the only true appreciators of this game. And the duty of introducing someone to it is one I take very seriously. If I could put a tux on, I would. A view of the field appears on the screen. There are a lot of different ways to behold this game. I like to think of it as I like to think of it as a rainbow of failed ideas. Some of these terrible ideas collapsed on themselves and disappeared. Some of these terrible ideas interacted with each other in any number of different ways. And some of these terrible ideas swallowed other less terrible ideas whole. We don't have the, the details of how exactly all of this came to be. Uh, there are some things we know. And there are a lot of very safe guesses and projections. One thing we do know is that this was once an NFL game between the Denver Broncos and Pittsburgh Steelers. It almost certainly started in the 21st century, probably the 2080s or 2090s. Over the next 15,000 years, the two-team system faded away. Outside teams, people, and interests began to interfere in the game, eventually claiming territory. Any questions? A territory of the map, a territory map of the game appears on the screen. Can we change the channel yet? No. The game is divided into 58 territories. The Broncos and Steelers each still have their own territory. Territory 1 is claimed by the Broncos, who have refused to participate in any of this evolution. Their, tor their territory remains completely unaltered. The hash marks are freshly painted, and the players still show up every Sunday in helmets and pads. They insist, without any success, that the game return to how it used to be. A wall stands between their territory and the others, though, so no one, no one really remembers who built it, though. The screen shows the large and football-looking side of the field. The Steelers still exist, but barely. Their, tor their territory, which once covered half the field, is now reduced to a single tiny corner. They would have disappeared from the field entirely were, were not for the Broncos, who leveraged whatever political power they still had to ensure their opponent was still in the game. There's one Steelers player who still comes back, like, every 500 years or so. They call him the last Steeler. He just kind of drags out a stool and sits there for an afternoon and then leaves. The screen zooms in on the remaining Steelers' territory. I mean, nothing, nothing much else for him to do up in that corner, really. Thanks to all the development, he can't even see half the field. I guess he feels like he should make an appearance now and then. Territories 8, 9, and 10, 8, 9, 10, and 11 were plotted out as an attempt to connect the Steelers and the Broncos so they could still actually play some kind of traditional football game. But rules on top of rules on top of rules made that impossible. There's a pause as nine attempts to process the game. I'm, I'm not understanding how it... Don't encourage me. No, 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 no. It's okay. How can I help you? Okay. Well, I don't understand how an NFL game went from that to this. Like, this started as just a standard NFL game with 15-minute quarters and everything, right? Yes. And the general consensus is that someone flipped some kind of switch in the rule book. 
at this point, the NFL was about 150 years old, and over the years, the rule book got larger and larger and became bloated with these endless addendums and conditions. Some were added to try to make the game more exciting, and others were added because a particular team or owner insisted. And in a lot of cases, they kept adding rules to properly define a certain element of the game. For example, how do you know if a player has control over the ball? I don't know. I mean, if they're holding the ball and not fumbling it, I guess. So you just sort of eyeball it, right? You don't conduct a geometric analysis of every biological vector and location of quadrillions of atomic part particles, right? You wouldn't, because having something is an artificial notion. It's a judgment call. If the NFL wanted to preserve what it was, it would have backtracked to that point. The referees should have been able to call the game as they saw and felt it. But instead, they tried to define what can't be defined without, like, a supercomputer. They took the catch rule and tacked on all kinds of conditions and rules and notes and everything onto it. Eventually, the catch section was 50 pages long. And it could only have so many rules until some of those rules begin to contradict each other or stack on each other in different ways. What we believe happened is that during this game, one of the teams cited a constellation of rules from across the rule book and used them to argue that they owned part of the field. And of course, once that became possible, the teams raced to lay claim to as much of the field as they could. The screen shows the real map of the game overlaid with the territory map. But, but now there are 58 teams, not two. Yep. Before long, individual players found that they could also prevent, present legal ar arguments for splintering off into their own factions. For one reason or another, some of them did. There were four teams, then seven, then 25. At one point, there were as many as 100. Some of those territories consolidated, and now there are 58. Territories 8 through 11 were originally one unified territory. A bureaucratic tug of war splintered them into narrow lines, which were then further carved apart by interests that had nothing to do with the football game. You can see the remnants of a baseball diamond they once, they once tried to build. Territory 13 is now home to some storage units. Territory 11 is the 49ers' attempt at some point in the 67th century to insert themselves as a third team. It's unclear why or what benefit it could have served them. It's been lost to, hi it's been lost to history. Territories 8, 9, and 10 are home to some housing units. These are mostly just rented out to, like, out-of-towners and whatnot. The screen shows the housing units in the middle of the field. So this part has nothing to do with football. Nah, not really. I mean, they don't have a lot of trouble filling it up. People dig the novelty of spending the night in the middle of an NFL game. But tenants' rights do give them authority to, like, make a play on the ball or something. And now I wonder what for. Like, if they did get the ball, what would they do with it? It's a good question. Probably try to, to score in the Broncos or Steelers end zones. The officials most likely wouldn't give them the points. Hard to know, really. They could also try and score in one of the alternate end zones. See those? The screen zooms out to show two end zones, misshapen and near opposite sidelines. I was going to ask about those. Well, those were acquired by players who deserted from the old rosters who insisted on playing their own game inside a game. They thought it was hopeless to try to score as the game was originally drawn up, but they still wanted to play. So they did their best to grab a little land for their... This is so fucking dumb. ...for their own end zones. But they couldn't acquire any territory in between them, and those territories don't like players stomping about on their fields. So that game's kind of not feasible these days, especially because they moved the Bojangles. Now Bojangles is right in the way. The screen shows the location of the old Bojangles and where it's located now. <laughs> Whoa. I know! I thought it was crazy, too. Bojangles is primarily a southern chain. I never thought they would expand to Colorado. I firmly believe that on a long enough scale of time, we could see a Kroger in Oregon. Kroorgan. Krogerun. Never mind. I'm going to crush you to the next asteroid I see. Okay, so, where's the ball? Well, now that's the big question. Thanks to a tracking system, we know that the ball is still somewhere on the field. But precise tracking was disabled thousands of years ago. There are plenty of places for it to hide, but there are 
about 100 permanent residences in this field. Uh, one of them should have stumbled upon it by now. I think someone has the world's best hiding place and isn't saying a damn thing. To be honest, though, most of these territories don't even care where the ball is. For the most part, they... Wait, wait, um, I don't understand why people would acquire territories in this field if they don't even want to play. If a piece of property is, valued, is valuable to someone, it's valuable to everyone. A lot of these territories are held by people holding out for a deal. Could be money, could be anything else. See Territory 56? Thousands of years ago, it was far larger, more valuable territory. It was once the only access point connecting Territory 17 and Territory 104, which no longer exists. That territory was claimed by a contingent of fans who demanded that brown mustard be provided in the concession areas. So they... People still go to this game? Oh, for sure they do. They don't pack it in like they used to, but 75,000 people bought a ticket for this game back in like 2080 or whatever. The stadium's generous re-entry policy lets them come and go. And at any given time, there's probably a thousand people in the... Oh, come on. Don't tell me that. You didn't know that? People sit in the stands and watch this, this fucking crap. This garbage. Don't wait if nothing fucking ever happens. Oh, yeah. Broncos fans are crazy. So anyway, the fans were like, we got the most crucial territory on the field. Give us some damn brown mustard or else. And the stadium management came back with, we're always looking to give our fans the best fan experience, but unfortunately our vendors, whatever, whatever. So they were like, fuck it, and made a lake out of it. That moment heavily influenced the geopolitical climate of Sports Authority Field at Mile High for centuries. Indeed, it... Is that a set of Sir Walter Raleigh? Yeah. The screen zooms in on a statue of Sir Walter Raleigh, tucked away near a wall on the field. Yep. Why? Is there any expl explanation you would possibly find satisfactory? No. I th think I'm fascinated by this game. Yes! No! I really am! Okay, it's like... Look at all the time it's taken to make this game what it is. You know, people have spent forever arguing, negotiating, and wow, look at those skyscrapers. I didn't even ask about those. The resources poured into this field are, are unbelievable. I mean, if they just worked together, think of the amazing game they could have made. They could have made something really cool, like some kind of wild maze or whatever. I, I don't know, but something that was, you know, 10,000 feet tall, but they don't want that. I mean, maybe they do on some level, but they can't work together. It's hideous. Holy shit, I like you. That is exactly it. That's exactly it. Yo, Tim, I think I know why you hate this, and I love it. I'll listen if you let me change the channel. Okay, okay but, but we're definitely going to watch more of it later, okay? Whatever. So, you know, you're American. You're from Florida. Built in California. Lost from Florida. Right. So I bet you see this, and you see a capitalist error. Capitalism run wild. Sure. It's so much salt in the soup. Capitalism can be around to run the entire show. There has to be some sort of counterbalance. If there isn't leverage on behalf of the common good, this is what you end up with. If the game still had a central governing body, nine is right. There could be something great, but it's just garbage dumb. It's a failure. That is capitalism, you donk. That is what it's supposed to be. This is how it ends. If it, if it isn't there, it's only because it isn't there yet. It's like you're staring at a cake in the oven and wondering if it's going to be cake. Things went the other direction in America, and thank God for that. But capitalism deserves a zoo like this one. It's, it's a beast of the wild, as wild as any grizzly bear with Fawn's blood in its mouth. I think you see deeds and contracts and bureaucratic bloat and see something that went wrong. Something was always wrong, y'all. I love it. I love to watch it. It's in a zoo where it can't hurt me. And people are tuning out. We are down to 106 listeners. People are listening to us? Like, like people on Earth? Well, do we? Only 98 now. Thanks for that, Juice. Thank you. 
Juice takes the diorama of the game and begins to exit stage left. Well, when you talk to a 15,754-year-old spacecraft who was built in Toulouse, this is what the fuck you get. Sorry for being bored in French. Juice exits stage left. End of scene 10. Scene 11. 9 and 10 are left alone on the stage. Question time. You promise. I did. Okay, what, um... Nine collects themselves and reads from a list of questions they have been writing. Why hasn't human technology advanced in the last 15,000 years? Why aren't humans trying to explore space? I mean, I know you already said that nobody knows why. People stopped aging and dying all of a sudden, but, like, do you expect to ever know the answer? Like, are they seriously going to live forever? For millions of years? Trillions of years? Aren't they going to get bored eventually? Are they all in a simulation or something? Or are they all in heaven or something? Are we going to be stuck out here forever? Like, do they know we're out here? Okay. Has Juice always been like that? Why did it take you so long to wake me up? What, what about the other countries? How come you're just watching America all day? You know, how are they doing? Where did Florida go? How long have you and Juice been awake? I mean, are there other space probes out there? And if so, do you talk to them? Like, have you seen any evidence of extraterrestrial life. How has is, how is the world changed politically? How are all the buildings in good shape, even the ones that have been around since the 1800s and the 1900s? You know, how, how have all, um, how have all the state boundaries remained exactly the same for 15,000 years? I mean, how come people look like they're different ages? Shouldn't everyone look like the same age? And also if crime has been eradicated, how, how come all the police officers in Nebraska were necessary? I like, am I gonna die? Should I have woken up? Like, why did you wake me up? Nine is hyperventilating, feeling the pressure and the uh, and the weight of all of their questions. I have an idea. Just take the one off the top. Okay. Why hasn't technology advanced in the last 15,000 years? You mean besides the nanos, right? Besides, you know, the brilliant nanotechnology that is only present on Earth and has helped to redefine the human existence. Well, yeah. Besides that. People mostly look and live like they always did. Images of old Plymouth Voyager ads begin to show on the screen. Nine slowly drifts towards ten. By the time fe ten finishes speaking, they're standing next to each other. Humanity could, humanity could have advanced if it wanted to. In fact, it did. Almost everything you think they would invent, they did. Flying cars, building that build themselves, just that can take you from Arkansas to Paris in five minutes. You don't see any of those things because people didn't want them. If they advance too much for that technologically, those advances would inevitably intrude in on their humanity. People wanted to walk. They wanted to take the balls that smelled like cigarettes. They wanted those precious three, five minutes between asking a question and knowing the answer. People defeated scarcity. Everybody had what they needed and nobody got sick. But they found that they needed, they needed things to be just a little bit difficult once in a while. They needed to stop their eyes and wait in the line and see that check engine light. They decided to leave their existence just a little short of perfect because they wanted to want. There's also something to be said for the mechanism of human change. It's largely, it's largely generational. People want and hopes and dreams evolve because young people entered the world and took another step forward. But this is the final generation. Yes, it is a 15,000-year-old generation. But just as you wouldn't expect it to go a third time, you would assume they want different things, different lives. They wanted things, and they got them all. The end, they could have observed in the years before people stopped aging. People sometimes talk about grandparents, who they knew in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. They tend to talk about the day-to-day -day, the -day sameness of their grandparents' lives. The furniture is what interests me specifically. It would never ever be rearranged. Sofas and armories will be shoved into the living room in 1955. They will sit there or moved until 1995. All the while, the legs slowly digging themselves into the carpet. Plates and portraits will hang on the walls or aeons. When you took them down, they will leave unbleached shadows of themselves in the paint. It would have been so simple for them to rearrange their things. To me, it seems so likely. Almost to the point of certainty that at some moments within those 40 years, they might want to, they never did, and they never even thought to. 
and why would they? Things were just the way they wanted them. Of course, women could, at any time, introduce things to make their lives more efficient. But we consider for scarcity human. We must also note that the time is no longer scarce. Efficiency is meant to save time, but their time is infinite. Why try to save something and have an infinite supply? You may have sorted them to dig up dead and hole in their boxes. You haven't been awake for long. I think you underestimate how exhausting it is to think big. You can only hold grand ambition above your shoulders for so long before you get tired. They got tired. Some lasted longer than the others, but they all got tired. Now they are resting in the moment that will last until the end of time. A pause as nine and 10 are now standing next to each other at stage right. As the next few lines are spoken, nine and 10 begin walking down stage together. The screen shows a picture of space, hundreds of little stars flickering for attention. I don't think of the space. Look at your telemetry data. How long have you been in space? 15,000 year, 15,000 years, 255 days, eight hours and four. Approximate, you can approximate. Nobody's checking your work anymore, okay? How fast are you traveling? About 12,000 miles per hour. How far are you from Earth? I mean, I guess I fell out of orbit in 1983, so about 1.6 trillion miles. And what's the trajectory? Headed roughly in the direction of the Andromeda system. Which is extraordinarily lucky for you. Andromeda is the nearest major galaxy, and you have been chugging towards it at 12,000 miles per hour for 15,000 years. How long before you reach it? Hmm. I'm 0.00001% of the way there. So that's 100, 100 thousandth of a percent. So that means. Um, I'll get there in 145 million years. 145 million years? Remember when I woke you up? That took what? 30 years. You, a machine with infinitely greater patience than a human being, almost went insane. I, they, they could go fast than I am though, like way faster than 12,000 miles per hour. That's our absolutely speed limit humans discovered for themselves or for anything they create. It's exactly 503.772 miles per hour. So yes, a lot faster than you, but nowhere even close to the speed of light. If they could actually sustain that speed permanently, which they couldn't, they will reach the nearest galaxy in 3.5 million years. I'm sure they can go faster than that though. I mean, they can figure it out. They went from winged flight to space travel in 60 years. You keep doing this. Doing what? You keep assuming that time guarantees something. That infinite time equals infinite everything. It doesn't. 500,000 miles per hour is the ceiling. People spent ages bumping into that ceiling. It cannot be moved. 9 and 10 have reached the front of the stage. As the next line is spoken, 9 moves across the center stage. Well, they've got to keep trying. It's their purpose. They, they have to see what's out there. They have all the time in the world to figure out some kind of solution. They have to keep trying. They can't just stop here. The stars must be explored. As Nine says explored, Ten speaks her next line while storming across to meet Nine at center stage. Why? Ten spins Nine around so their backs are facing the audience. They begin to walk forward again, this time upstage. Consider why you want this. People have found their home and their eternity. This is the final stage. Wait, where are we going? Up here, dummy. It's the, the watchability of this is like kind of... Shut the fuck up. Okay. As I was saying, people have found their home and their eternity. They have decided that this is the final stage. Humans were once explorers and conquerors. That was their embryonic stage. A stage which is now finished. They tried to explore it. Early efforts resulted in, well, you and me. Later, they built the Hubble telescope. Hubble, say hi. Hubble enters near center stage. Interrupted from whatever they are doing, they clearly don't want to be here. Nine and 10 turn around, so all three are facing the audience. Hey. Speak up, we can barely hear you. 
Mm, I'd rather not. I'm watching a game. You're being rude. Nine just woke up. Come on. Congrats. What? Congrats! Oh, thanks. Back to the game. You guys have fun. Hubble exits from where he entered. <clears throat> Nine and ten continue moving upstage, this time walking backwards, facing the audience. Hubble doesn't talk much, but he gave people stunning images of the cosmos, an endlessly bright and colorful universe for us to explore and conquer. It didn't turn out that way. Humanity tried and tried to send themselves to other solar systems. In 3143, they succeeded and founding, found nothing. No life, nothing interesting, a bunch of planets full of rocks and gas. Then they deployed probes to visit other stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But do you know how many stars there are in their galaxy? There are 250 billion. Specifically, there are 257 billion, 880 million, 113,002 stars. You have to use a minimum of 900 pounds of metal to build a deep space probe. So if you want to send one to each star, that's nearly 120 billion tons of metal. 9 and 10 now start to walk to stage left. That demonstrates the enormity of the galaxy, yes? We can't visit each star because we literally don't have enough stuff to build it. We couldn't mine that much without seriously damaging our planet or another planet. 9 and 10 begin to walk forward again, downstage. So we, so we built what we could and sent them out there. They found nothing even the slightest bit interesting. Everything was as we guessed when we saw it through the telescope. It was the grandest anticlimax imaginable. It shattered what people thought of themselves and their destinies. The letdown was, in itself, a sort of brilliant wonder of its own. The space probes are all out here. We're still out here, ready to tell ground control if we see something. That is a fantasy, because we won't. And if we do, it will be on a scale of time so impossibly vast that it may as well be never. People had a choice. They could continue wandering through the endless darkness, an absence of everything they loved, an endless void of disappointment and loneliness. There's a pause as 10 and 9 continue to the front of the stage. Or they could look down and embrace what they always had and loved. Nine slowly exits stage left. As 10 continues speaking, she moves towards center stage. The lights dim and a spotlight shines on her. The screen shows Earth slowly revolving as the camera moves over top of it. Struggle, true, unfabricated struggle, is a cocoon they have shed. Humans are beings of the land and sea who have refused to cast themselves into the cosmic zoo. Exploration and conquest are meaningless. They have achieved their final form, and they are resting in an eternal moment. They are creatures of play. They will be creatures of play until the end of time. Ten exit stage right. The screen finishes panning over Earth for a minute longer. Lights dim. End of scene 11. End of act 1. Intermission.